Manassas Foundation. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, LA, and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello? Hello, can I please speak with Tim Robbins? <laughs> Hello, sir. How are you? Hello, Tim. It's such a pleasure to hear your voice again after so many years. I I was just reminiscing and actually looking up when you and Studs Turkle did that most memorable event at LACMA 20 years ago in January. Oh, my. Isn't it amazing? I had to look it up, Tim. 20 years ago in January 2000. And I will never forget when, when Studs got on stage and told you that he had played in the Chicago pr- premiere of Cradle Will Rock in 1938. And to see, to see your face stunned at that moment as your movie had just come out is one of the most memorable moments I, I can remember. Oh, man, what a great evening that was. And what a great man he was. Uh, I remember also when I called you up to say, "Will you will you interview Studs Terkel?" and and you said, "But you know, how can I interview the man who has interviewed ten thousand people?" And I said, "That's your challenge." And then you bought a plane ticket and came out. What a be- <laughs> what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful night! One I will never forget. Now, um, are you still having actually your your actors at the <laughs> actors gang read Studs Terkel? I remember you had them read working we're um in the process of developing a a new piece uh on hard times uh his oral history of the depression how fantastic so indeed they are reading studs turkle oh yes since the pandemic hit we've been doing uh, zoom workshops and um this is one of the pieces we've been developing it's it's incredibly resonant to today it's uh of course, going to unfortunately get more and more relevant as uh, people get more um, hit by the economic fallout of this uh, pandemic. I have been wanting to do uh, a piece with Studs' uh, work for many years, and this this was seemed like the perfect opportunity to delve into those voices from the past, you know, those incredible uh, stories that people tell about what it was like to live in the Depression and most importantly, to survive it, and and it's resonant today. In what way for you? Well, I think we're all go- we're all facing an economic fallout from uh, the inability to um, carry on with life as normal. Certainly, in the arts, anyone that makes any money uh, around an industry that relies on the gathering of people together in a room, but uh, across the. Uh, uh, Sector uh, of the economy, um, you know, restaurants and uh, all the different uh, industries affected by this, and uh, people downsizing, and more and more people unemployed, and more and more people facing challenges of putting food on the table. I, I didn't think I'd ever live to see the day where uh, you would walk into a supermarket in America and see empty shelves or see the incredibly long lines at food banks. Uh, throughout the country. Um, we're living in a very um, unique and challenging time, and um, I think it's up to the artists to understand that and to reflect that and to tell stories that are relevant to the audiences uh, for now. You know, I was I was very interested in, in, a, in something you said just before the pandemic hit us in the Dur- Durango Herald. You said, what I love about theater is it's a real opportunity for a temporary community. I'd love yes. you, I'd love you to expand on that. I find I find it beautifully put. Well, we were um with, right when the pandemic was hitting, we were out on the road uh, in the United States with a national tour of a play that we developed at the Actors Game called The New Colossus, which is a 12 actors from 12 different parts of the world telling the stories of their ancestors' migration to freedom. Uh, speaking in 12 different languages from 12 different time periods. 
And the story is uh, was uh, incredibly resonant in America. It, 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 the audiences were just amazing. And, and part of the experience of going to see New Colossus was that the play reaches its resolution with an, a question to the audience. You've, you've, you've been following the journey of these 12 people who, have, who, have, who are running away from uh, oppression, trying to seek freedom. And at the end, the boat arrives and they ask to be allowed on the boat in these 12 different languages, all at the same time. And then a question appears on a uh, super title. Should we let them in? And the audience has to answer before the play proceeds. And across America, the answer was yes. Across America, people saw that they are immigrants. Everyone in this country, unless you're born in an indigenous uh, family, or unless you were brought here against your will, descended from people that were brought here against their will, you are an immigrant. So what we found was this incredible reaction across America. And then at the very end, after the uh, curtain call, I would come out at the end and I'd ask the audience uh, where they're from. And I'd ask if there, first of all, if there is any indigenous people here and what nation are you descended from? And then I'd ask, is there anyone here that was descended from people that were brought here against their will? And African-Americans would raise their hand. And often I'd ask, do you know where from? And often they'd say, no. One of our biggest tra tragedies, our greatest sins, that we eliminated a history in, in a people. And then I asked, are there any refugees? <clears throat> and some hands would come up and I'd ask where and what year. And then are there any immigrants in the audience? And more hands would come up, where, where from, what year? And then I'd ask, are there any sons or daughters of immigrants or refugees? And more hands would come up and more countries would be represented. And then grandsons, granddaughters of immigrants and refugees, more hands would come up. Great grandsons, great granddaughters of immigrants and refugees. And before you know it, the entire audience has raised their hand. And there is the sense of who we are, our community. A temporary community, but one that is really together, in a sense. And it United by so many, many things. And by so many stories, and maybe by so many, in, in effect, different but also similar stories. And you know, Tim, it reminded me of a poem uh, by the Somali British poet, I wonder if you know her, Warson Shur. Uh, the poem is called Home. I'll read you just a few lines where she says, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. No one, so leaves, no one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And she ends by saying, no one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. So, so beautiful. So true. Yeah. <clears throat> so true. And we started developing the new colossus when the Syrian crisis was happening. And we were seeing in the press this incredibly horrific description of these people as potential terrorists. And I'm thinking, well, no one leaves home. No one wants to leave their home. And, and how dare they imply that these mothers and daughters and sons and grandparents that are in refugee camps throughout Europe are somehow parasitical. And, and it just was so uh, uh, against everything that I have believed and, and, and have been brought up to believe about America and, fought, and about the and, West and, fought and about for, freedom. And fought for. And fought for. And here's the thing. This is our common story from the very first boat that landed here, that people are leaving Europe to escape religious oppression to the person that's crossing over the border today. There's a common threat. There's a common story. And we're all the same in that quest for freedom. Nobody leaves their home and walks 500 miles by foot with the chance that they might get into a place if there isn't something very bad happening where they're coming from. And so part of, why the reason we, part of the reason we wanted to do New Colossus was to call attention to this and to call attention to in a divisive country, in a, a country that is so, there are so many uh, voices trying to divide us, that we have so much in common with so many people. And what was beautiful about the New Colossus was there you had in, in the middle of Iowa, 
people sitting next to each other and realizing, oh my, oh my goodness, there's incredibly diverse community here. I didn't even realize that. So many people came up to us and said, in North Carolina, someone came up to me and said, listen, I really appreciate this because I didn't realize how diverse and wonderful Charlotte was before we display. You have, and then at the very end, I, I said, listen, does anyone want to share their story or their ancestors' story? And oh my God, the stories we heard, the stories of incredible bravery, incredible resilience, incredible strength in their ancestors or in them to overcome obstacles that were insane. We heard stories of, 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 of kids jumping off ships and swimming to the, to the to the shore and hiding out in horse barns for, for a year before they were, they found some place to live. 11 year old kid, this, this guy's great grandfather that t- told this story um, and stories of a woman who, who uh, at, at nine years old was sent from Europe on a ship to land in New York Harbor with only a photograph of, of her relative, no address, no money, and somehow in this huge city finds her family. It, 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 the the story of a woman that came up to me out of outside of the, the uh, theater in Los Angeles when we were doing it there it says, "I want to tell you the story about um, a soldier, an American soldier." Uh, he was part of a troop that was uh, liberating Buchenwald, the concentration camp. And he saw this woman faltering, starving, emaciated. And he saw, he, he, she was going to fall. So he starts running over to help this woman. And the sergeant says, stand down, private. That's not what we're doing right now. He disobeys his sergeant. He gets to this woman before she falls. He, he catches her. He carries her to the medics. He gets in trouble. But after he's out of trouble, he goes and visits her. And this woman outside the theater in Los Angeles says to me, that was my mother and my father. Stories about people surviving in concentration camps, then surviving in, in camps out after the war, then f- trying to get over to America and taking journeys that took three, four years, various countries, people that weren't accepted even after surviving the Holocaust. This is the kind of resilience and character that defined this country and made us who we are. That character, that resilience, that strength, that beauty is what America is all about. You know, Tim, before we talk about your most recent project, I was so interested, and in a way you've already expressed this, but perhaps we can even get deeper into this issue. You recently said in a a New York Times piece, when theater returns, it must return with danger. What did you mean then? Well, I I meant that we are currently living in a situation where the gathering of people is forbidden. And so we must react to that. We must come back with the idea that, oh, no, this isn't some, some kind of uh, you know, inconvenience. This was a threat to our survival as artists. And if, unless you're willing to take that up and operate under those kinds of stakes, I believe that what we're, what we're going to be putting out will be irrelevant. We have to acknowledge the moment. We have to acknowledge that we are in a very, very unique situation, rarely seen in human history, where art and artists and gatherings of people and music and theater and movies, uh, gathering to see a movie, all of them have been absent from our lives. So when we re-enter that arena, we have to re-enter with full knowledge and acknowledgement of, of this situation. And so the material that we do must must understand this. The, uh, the material that we First, address an audience and invite an audience in to receive. It has to reflect the times we're living in. And in a sense, uh, Tim, you're already back to that form of theatre with your most recent project, which I just heard, thank you for sending it, called Bobo Supreme. What what led you to the project? And if you could tell our listeners what it is, it's it's most marvelous. And I'd love you to unpack it a little bit. I know we okay. want, I, I know we want to keep a little bit of a surprise, but a teaser, please, Tim. <laughs> well, uh, Bobo Supreme is something I wrote last summer. I was uh, up in Boston, and I had an apartment overlooking Boston Common where, uh, for all intents and purposes, the American Revolution started, uh, the murder of Crispus Attucks. Mm. I was very close to uh, uh, what the cauldron was that created this country we live in and the freedoms that w- we're supposed to be uh, living up to. And so I was inspired to write, and I, uh, I had been wanting to do you know, a, another look at Bob Roberts, the film I did in 92 about a Republican folk singer that, uh, seeking the, uh, the, the uh, senatorial position. 
and running for office. A successful businessman who uh, is also a uh, entertainer and a fan of beauty patterns. And, and I didn't realize at the time I was foreseeing the rise of Donald Trump, but it has been, you know, unfortunately, uh, more and more relevant, Bob Roberts. And uh, incidentally, almost impossible to find on any streaming service, and we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I, w- I didn't want to write a sequel to Bob Roberts. I didn't want to imagine who Bob was now. What I did was I took the uh, idea of Bob Roberts, and I applied the idea of another character to him, and I wrote from that character's perspective. And that character is Ubu Wa, Ubu the King. Uh, uh, um, Jari. Jari. Alfred Jari's <clears throat> surrealist uh, Dadaist p- piece from 1902. At the first performance in Paris, the, the audience was so appalled by this character that they tore up the seats of the yeah. theater and riot. Yeah, yeah. fantastic story. And this is the first play that the Actors Gang did uh, professionally. I didn't know. And it was the, it was the thing that propelled us into uh, the, the, this 40-year history that we now have. Um, so I, I, I've always been fascinated by this character. And so I wrote this um, unrelenting id, this unfiltered, um, um, misogynistic, uh, horrible person who happens to be the president of the United States. Hmm. And his name is Bobo Supreme. And he has turned the White House into an entertainment studio. He's got a, uh, a morning show, a set. He's got a... Um, uh, a game show that he does in the afternoon. He's uh, got uh, a strip club. He's got a, a radio room. A, uh, um, he's got uh, all kinds of paraphernalia everywhere. And he's got also a recording studio. He interviews he, himself. And he interviews himself <laughs> on his own television show. So I wanted to satirize Trump, but I, uh, it's so very hard to satirize something that is this far a field. And so I, I went primal with it. And I, um, I just started creating this world of uh, a, a, a person out of control, an ego out of control, and based in a um, an entertainment milieu. So he, there's five, uh, six songs in, in the piece. I think it's very funny. It is. Uh, very but it's funny. also it's funny. And but uh, who, who is laughing at who? And it's very dangerous. And uh, so I, I, of course, um, went out to seek funding for it. And, um, of course, the people <laughs> were a little scared of it. So I felt self-financed it, and I uh, started recording it um, earlier in the summer. I, w- I had been intending to do it as a film. Adam McKay had uh, jumped on board as a producer, and we were seeking financing, and then the, the pandemic hit. And the lockdown happened. And so films became impossible. So I thought, well, what can we do? Well, I can make a film, uh, an audio film, what I'm calling a, 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 a um, oral cinema, A-U-R-A-L. And the idea is that it's in motion all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a radio play, but it's in motion. There's so many different sets. And so um, I got some friends together. Uh, I uh, In this cast are Jack Black, um, uh, Alfre Woodard, Isla Fisher, uh, Ted Levine, Ray Wise, Haley Joel Osmond, uh, Patton Oswalt, Ricky Lindholm, uh, and uh, several other incredibly talented actors, uh, many from the Actors Gang. And uh, I, I recorded it in the summer, and I just finished editing it, and we're going to be putting it out shortly. Where will people um, find it? Um, they're going to find it through me. Okay. Bec- because the distribution platforms are, are um, at, at least right now, not embracing it. So we've decided to go rogue and completely do it on our own and hope that uh, with the Internet and with word of mouth that it will go viral and, and become something that people hear. Please send me the information when it when it comes out because I'll I'll certainly disseminate it to the best of my ability. At one point Bobo sings I am everything you are trying to hide. As you see it, what does Trump reveal about us that we are perhaps trying to hide? I think he's giving license to bigotry. Uh, I think he's giving license to ignorance racism. But I also understand something about the people that supported Trump. And I believe that it's based in a betrayal. It's based in a in an idea that no one is listening. No one is hearing them. And unfortunately, you had someone from the right, someone with fascist t- tendencies, tap into that. 
I believe that Bernie would have tapped into that same energy and done a lot more good things for the country four years ago. But that wasn't to be. So now we're in a situation where we have an incredibly discontented mass of people in this country that do not trust any information coming out of them from the various media outlets. And he has very shrewdly, from the very start, attacked the media so that any information that comes out about will be immediately questioned, regardless of whether it's true or not. It's brilliant strategy. It's fascistic. And it's following in the playbook of Mein Kampf. Which, incidentally, um, you, in, in, in Bobo Supreme, you, you actually feature a reading of Mein Kampf about the big lie. And you, you once said about the invasion of Iraq that we were led to war by weapons of mass deception. What are the weapons of mass deception do you think you're most concerned about at this very moment today? Well, you have a president going out in front of the country and saying that the election will not be be honored. The, the results of the election will not be honored. You have a, a, a man that has encouraged violence uh, against people that disagree with him. You have an armed populace that are, you know, ready to take action. You have the lionization of a 17-year-old boy who crossed state lines with an AR-14 on a major media outlet. I mean, if this isn't if this isn't uh, the most dangerous uh, threat to our democracy or our republic, uh, I don't know what it is. You have people uh, that are you're 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 talking about a completely. Uh, corrupt and manipulative administration that is looking at the polls, seeing they're going to lose, and uh, maybe in an effort to stay out of jail, I don't know, are about ready to steal this election. And if they have to do it by force, they will, because this is about one man's ego. And this is about protecting this fragile ego. And what's shocking to me is that there are so many people that have bought into it, that there are so many people that are willing to overlook the hypocrisy of this man and the, the, the things he's actually said out loud, willing to overlook all that and vote for him. It's both shocking and, and perhaps not. Well, what's shocking is that there's 60 million of them. That's what's shocking. We have always had these, these, uh, you know, on the margins of society, we've always had the David Dukes and the, you know, Ku Klux Klaners and the proud racists and the Civil War aficionados that want to continue fighting it. We've always had that. We've always had racism, but we've never had it advertised from such a large platform from the very start. These are very good people. Remember Charlottesville? These are very good. There's good people on both sides. No, these are Nazis. We fought a war to, to, to stop this. These are, these are, People that think people should be deported because they're of a different color. These are not good people. And and think about it. If you were on the margins there, and you were like, uh, well, you know, I'm not quite a, I'm not quite that. Uh, but I, you know, I agree with him on some of some things. But I'm not quite that. And then he comes out and says, that's okay. You can be that. And then they see a movement growing, and they join it because. It's all that the dark corner of the heart that has believed something for a long time, but knew they couldn't say it out loud. And here is the president of the United States saying it's okay to say it out loud. That's what that's what's ultimately the most damaging thing to our country is it's empowered that hateful part of the heart that had been dormant for so many years because, yeah, it's inappropriate. Yeah, it's not good to say those things out loud. Yeah, it is not accepted by polite society. But now, ah, no, now we are empowered. Now we will show up at these rallies. Now we will chant these things. Now we will finally live up to the to our hatred that has been in us forever. Because forever it's been told to me that I'm a bad person because I say these things. But now the President of the United States is saying it's on the spot. Noam Chomsky said something that I'd love you to react to. He said, we shouldn't be looking for heroes. We should be looking for good ideas. Where do you find those good ideas now? Oh, well, I'm s almost 62, so <laughs> I've, I've, I've had such a lifetime of good ideas uh, presented to me. So many mentors, so many incredible minds that I've been able to talk to and sit and have meals with people from Studs Terkel to uh, Howard Zinn, to Harry Belafonte, to Robert Altman, to 
Johnny Cash. Uh, I've I've had a, 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 a incredible mentorship from um, very strong, independent minds, people who uh, who were guiding lights for me. And um, I now uh, I now see uh, a society that has more uh, has embraced these voices, this iconoclasm, this independent thought more and more and more. I am uh, excited by that. I am inspired by that. I, I believe that um, we face a, a huge challenge in how change will happen, uh, more so than ever before, of course, because there is such an empowerment of ignorance and, uh, and hatred. But I also am concerned about how we uh, that want progress, that want progressive thought and progressive legislation, how we, how we are inclined to, to fight with each other, to marginalize each other, to, to have a purity test that uh, can oftentimes uh, limit debate and limit discussion. And um, I wonder sometimes whether that isn't manipulated by those that want to divide us. I, I am concerned that um, we're living in a culture that is turning on itself. And um, when I see people being shamed for progressive thought from both sides of the aisle, um, that's where I, uh, I, I worry the most. That's where I, I wonder whether we can actually achieve the progress that is needed. When you serve the middle, you're not going to get anywhere. And um, what the right has understood for years is that as, as crazy as you might think their base is, the kind of fundamentalist Christian rapture kind of base the Republican Party has. They have never really disrespected them. They've always kept them in the tent. And I don't believe the Democrats have done that with the, the, the leftists and the, 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 uh, the people that um, are, are pushing the boundaries. Oftentimes I feel like those people are shamed and, 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 I, and I don't see how that's good election strategy. I don't see how that helps. We have to be inclusive. We have to stop fighting with each other. We have to stop picking on people that uh, might be the, to the left of you. It, it, it's not productive. You want you, you. This is your base. This is the people that will work for you. These are the people that will knock on doors. These are the people that will make phone calls. Why alienate them? I don't understand the strategy. So um, I hope certainly hope that uh, we'll have a dis different president in the United, in in the White House after this election. I hope it's a Democrat. But I'm also very fully cognizant of the idea that whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, it's really up to the people. If they want real change, they have to advocate for it and agitate for it and protest for it. It won't just come. It never just comes. Throughout history, it's always been the grassroots that has changed them. And it never happens overnight. It happens through a long, long process of pushing, pushing. Pushing, protesting, collective action. So interesting to hear you also mention Howard Zinn. You know, the president recently mentioned Howard Zinn, and I was heartened to see how many Howard Zinn books were sold thereafter. <laughs> yeah, well, there you have it. You know, that's it's another indication. Okay, and and we should we should be very clear eyed about this, and we should look at it for what it is. It's another indication of what fascism is. Who do they go after first? They go after the intellectuals, the academics, and the artists. And him mentioning that name put a, a real big fear in my in my being because there it is, right there. Round up those books, burn those books. We that's propaganda against America. And there you have the book burning, and there you have the intellectuals being arrested and put in, put in, put in, or deported or killed. This isn't a joke. This is real. He's saying it. He's saying it out loud. Uh, we shouldn't mince words here. He is textbook authoritarian moving into fashion. That is as clear as that. And I think the time for, uh, you know, this idea that we, you know, balanced, you know, we have to be fair. We have to be balanced. No, no. We have to tell the truth right now. And if you read history, it's every indication that where we're headed is about as far away from the tenets of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence as has ever happened in this country. And we have to be very clear eyed and see that threat, and call it out for what it is and vote and vote and vote. There are millions and millions of people in this country that do not vote. Those are the people that need to rise up right now. 
Because unless we have a major, major victory, we're going to be, and even maybe if we do, we're going to be in a, a, a protracted struggle for truth in this country. You know, when you th were speaking about uh, Burn the Books, it it so much reminded me of Heinrich Heine, who 200 years ago said, where they burn books, they will also ultimately burn people. And you bet they will. So dangerous. I mean, it's already happening. There's a, a guy that was lynched and burned uh, a couple of days ago in this country. You know, that's <laughs> that's where we're living right now. It's it's enough of a challenge this pandemic. Uh, just just to um, remain in a society because we we're no longer in in gathering places. So we have to gather through this other means, and it's like a a, a different kind of gathering place. It's a it's a it's a um, Uh, a gathering place where everyone is blind. You cannot see faces. And so you're hearing, you're hearing, or you're typing, or you're reading, but you're not looking eye to eye. And that's the thing that is the most dangerous thing in communication right now, is that we are not looking at each other. We're not looking in each other's eyes and seeing the soul and seeing the heart and the truth that is in other people's eyes. It's all abstract. I, I have been, you know, vilified in an abstract way on social media from people who I don't know. And it affects you. But I always have to remind myself it's an abstraction. Right. It's not real. It's what you call a keyboard reality. Right. And I think it's much more difficult to hate someone when you're looking in their eyes. Right. It's, it, 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 there is something in us that I have faith in, the human condition. I have faith that there is the, the, the existence of empathy in the heart. And that empathy is comes to fruition in direct contact. Um, in, a, in a disaster, all those abstractions go away for most people. You know, If someone's yeah, drowning, yeah. you jump in and save them. If someone's had a car accident, you pull over and help. It doesn't matter what their race is, what their political views is. It doesn't matter. It's about humanity. And I believe we're spinning out of control in this echo chamber of hatred and division through social media. On all sides, I'm talking about everybody. I'm talking about myself. It's a very dangerous time because of that. And the pandemic has exacerbated that problem and that danger. We need to get out and we need to see people with masks on. But we need to find a way to create community again. And that's why theater is essential. It's why music is essential. It's why all art is essential. Because it creates community in its very existence. And the, um, <laughs> the idea that uh, we have shut that off is for me very troubling and i look forward to being able to open the doors of our theater again and and start telling stories again but it, and in the meantime i'm doing my best to try to do it in this other platform you know we're in a society if you look to even 20 years ago when we were doing that studs turkle interview there were bookstores there were record shops there were independent movie theaters And this has all gone away. You can't even go get a videotape now or DVD. So what is that? What is that? How did we get there? Now everything's so convenient. It's all online. You can have a million songs on your, your device and everything's cool, right? No, because there's cultural arbiters now. There's actually people that decide what movies are on their platform. You do not have the choice to go to your DVD or video store and pick out a movie you want to watch. You have to look at the menu that's presented to you by a cultural arbiter. That's very dangerous because it's not, I'm not saying the cultural arbiter is some kind of, uh, you know, political censor. It's just not a, a level playing field. It's not a fair representation of the history and breadth of the library of the creative work that artists have done. It has, there is a filter that it goes through. And I question that filter because when it does become political, when it does become about content, then you have a very, very clever way of censoring. It doesn't even look like censorship. You don't even recognize it. There's no real blacklisting. There's no real censorship. It's just, hey, you know, I can't find it on my, you know, my various platforms. It's not there. Well, why isn't it there? Why isn't everything there? Mm. Why are why do why can't we have access to every single film ever made? We have the technology, so why don't we have the access? 
And that was the promise of, of the internet in so many ways. Right. And how many times when I was growing up, I would go to the record store and I, you know, a new album would be coming out and I want to check it out. But I wasn't just going to check that album out. I'm going to talk to the record store guy. What else is going on? What else is, what, what music are you playing right now? Hey, what about this album? Yeah, well, I'll put it on for you. You want to hear a little bit of it? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here. Oh, yeah, I want that. It's cool. How the hell would punk rock ever, ever, ever break through in this in this world right now? It barely broke through when it came out. It was, it was hard to find then because there were such radical uh, um, voices, a new form of music that it was shattering the kind of disco culture of the '70s and the you know the kind of yacht rock that was happening, stuff that was unattached from the world that most of us were living in, and. We don't have that record store anymore. We don't have that meeting place. Bookstore. You go in, you go, what's up? Literate employees who, who, who know literature that can recommend something to you. Hey, I've heard about this author, this guy, Kurt Vonnegut. What's a good book to start with? Well, I'd start with Cat's Cradle. That conversation's gone. Now. You don't get that conversation online. So I guess what I'm saying is if there are independent bookstores in your area, if there's still that guy selling vinyl, if there are, 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 are the local theater companies that are able to open after this pandemic, if there are independent film uh, theaters, support them. Mm -hmm. Support them. They're the last line of a, of, of a contact with literature, with art, with things that can operate outside of corporate accept acceptability, a corporate, corporate culture. I remember when we met 20 years ago, Tim, you you had purchased typewriters for your children. <laughs> yes, yes. Because I wanted them to feel the tactile sensation, of what it is to actually press a button and to see that letter represented on a piece of paper immediately. There was something that I, I, I felt was being lost by putting your art or your literature or your writing onto an abstract form. They still have those typewriters. They don't use them. They're beautiful to look at. <laughs> But, you know, I oftentimes think, uh, what, what happens, you know, after a storm or, you know, the power goes out? What happens? What do we, how do we communicate in that darkness, in that lack of electricity? And I imagine, a, you know, I was writing, I'm, I'm still working on this piece, uh, like what, what would happen if everything, everything in the, on the, in the cloud just disappeared? Talk about abstract. We're putting our photos, our memories, our literature, our art, our music all up in this abstract cloud. Well, what happens if that goes away? What are we left with? That's why I buy vinyl. <laughs> That's why I still have books. Where will the books be? If, the, if, we're, if we're assuming that it's, oh, it's so much more convenient and, and we save so much space by not having to have books in our house. It's all on my computer. What happens if that goes away? What happens to literature? What happens to history? What happens to music? Now, the good news here is that the live event is still as vital, if not more vital than ever. Live music, live theater. You can't replace that. It's so unique. And it's been there forever, from the very first fire where someone sang. The very first event in a village that was celebrating a uh, passing or a, uh, uh, a marriage, the theatrical event of that. That exists. That will always exist. Right now it doesn't. And that's why when we return to it, when we return to live performance, when the first bands start to play, when the first theater companies start to mount plays, we have to understand the importance and also the danger of it because art is essential. The reason why uh, authoritarians and fascists come after artists isn't because they just don't like art. It's because they understand the power of storytelling. They understand the human connection that happens between the artist and the audience. And they understand that that is way more powerful and holds way more true than any political speech they may make. They understand that the artist is power. Tim, it's been a, a, a true pleasure to talk to you and I I can't wait and I want our listeners to really make a note of it. I can't wait for Bobo Supreme to come out. You let us know where to find it and we'll disseminate it as much as we possibly can through all the channels we know and make I it can so tell you right now it'll be on bobosupreme.com. There you have it. Just make a note of it, bobosupreme.com. And when, when will we have the pleasure of hearing it, do you think? 
I uh, will be releasing it next week. Excellent. So sometime in October, we will we will be able to to hear Bobo. Oh, it'll be but it'll be uh, it'll be available in October. Yes. That's wonderful, Tim. Thank you so much for taking the time. Stay safe, and I hope we meet again and not in twenty years. <laughs> thank you so much, Paul. Take good care. Thank you so much. Bye bye. It's been a pleasure. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support.